You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Hey, welcome back to the Chris Spangle Show. Thank you so much for joining me here on the program, and I'm glad to have you here with me today. Uh, you know, in, in my last episode, I talked a little bit about the Libertarian Party and political action, so this is going to seem a little hypocritical. Uh, I'll tell Jeff Moore, my guest, what I said, uh, and then he can tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, but he is running for the Indiana Secretary of State's office. And this is an incredibly important race for libertarians in Indiana, both Big L and Little L, and important for Republicans and Democrats, too, because the Secretary of State's race is the ballot access race. Uh, that is how libertarians for four years will get on the ballot. Is it four or two? It's four. Uh, the Secretary of State's office is a four-year term, and winning it or whatever results any party gets determines that party's ballot access um, issues and capabilities for the next four years. So, Jeff, you've decided to run for this office. It also has a lot to do with business regulation. So it's just like the, the perfect Libertarian Party office. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Why are you running for Indiana Secretary of State? Sure. Well, first, Chris, it's good to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, in honor of being with someone who's so well bearded, I tried to grow mine out a little bit, but it's it's nothing like yours. I'll need some oh, more time. It's, it, it's cute. <laughs> I should uh, say I'm your name that. is Jeff Moore. I don't know that I actually introduced you. I started ranting right away. Uh, Jeff Moore, who's running for Indiana Secretary of State, who is the candidate this time, coming in, coming in a long line of great libertarian candidates like Mark Rutherford, Rebecca St. Burris, Mike Cole, uh, this has always featured some of the top talent and you are absolutely one of those folks and I'll be proud to vote for you this fall. Uh, so it is the ballot access race for libertarians. It is, are you, are you going to be head of the election division? I don't, I think like you're deeply involved in election stuff, but maybe not head of the election division per se. What exactly does the secretary of state's office do here in Indiana? Sure. So there's a lot there. So um, and you asked me who I am and why I'm running. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack all one one thing at a time here. So the secretary of state's office itself is the third highest constitutional office in Indiana. It is defined and prescribed in our Constitution of 1816. Uh, basically, a line of succession goes governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state. Historically, it has been an administrative office. office. It has been keeper of the seal. Um, and there are currently four divisions within the Secretary of State's office and four key responsibilities. The first is Chief Elections Officer, and that's what everybody sort of knows best. Uh, and certainly when we look at the 2020 and 2016 elections most recently, and where there's been concern about the authenticity and output of those election cycles. Uh, so there's been more and more focus. Secretaries of state across the nation have been in the limelight for the processes and laws of their state and to make sure that we're executing uh, fair and just elections. Uh, the second division is the business services division, which essentially licenses or creates businesses into law. Uh, and that also includes nonprofits. So when we talk about how do we respond to the needs of communities uh, such as homelessness or, or you name it? Um, so much of that work is done through nonprofits that actually seek private donations. And one of the privileges of this office is to sign them into existence, um, just the same as for profit corporations. Uh, and I'll, let's get back to small businesses and entrepreneurs and innovators uh, just the same. The third division regulates the auto dealers, um, and the last division, the fourth division, investigates what we'll call white collar crime or securities crime. Essentially, if you sell me a Target gift card uh, fraudulently, that's not necessarily a securities crime. But if you sell me shares in a company that doesn't exist or is fraudulent in some way, then that could become uh, part of an investigation of the Secretary of State's office. Wow. All right. You are very well versed and uh, know your stuff inside and out. I, I you, mean, you too can read the website. <laughs> well, that, you know, not a lot of candidates in the past have. So I'm very, very impressed already. Um, so why did you want to run and why are you qualified to hold this office? Sure. So my background, um, I my 
undergraduate degree is in business administration or business and international marketing. Uh, and my career has been in budget finance. I managed a $300 million budget uh, in a large nonprofit higher education organization. Um, I worked in clean tech in for a company that was in the trucking transportation sector. So I've and I had my own virtual reality startup that I actually founded here. So I was a customer of, or user of the Secretary of State's office. And I've been through that process from the small business uh, tech startup perspective. And it's not as easy as it should be. Um, and we can talk about what that means for innovation and who's your small businesses. Um, but what what really qualifies me is my is where I've seen technology solve problems and how we get to a better tomorrow by using and implementing better technologies and processes today. So stepping back and seeing the hurt and pain that our nation endured on January 6th and wanting to never see harm come from neighbor to neighbor uh, ever again. Uh, hopefully we, we put that behind us with the Civil War. But uh, where we have a problem with our technology and our process, our elections just aren't trustworthy enough for enough Americans to feel confident in those results. And when we can't be confident in our elections, we can't be confident in our elected officials. And that needs to change. So what are some steps that you take to make sure the Indian elections are secure? That's presuming they're not secure. I have maintained throughout all of this. All you've got to do is go down to your county clerk and volunteer. That's literally all you've got to do. They're begging for people. There's a large uh, generation gap that, of people that are not stepping up to volunteer. You can go and be a, be a part of the system and see how secure this system actually is. Uh, and if you don't believe me, prove me wrong. Go volunteer uh, and and work the polls on Election Day. I've watched them as a, a party official, as a journalist. And I can tell you it, it's it's far different than you see on the news, Jeff. I even actually served on the uh, Help America Vote Act Commission back in 2011, I believe. By then, Secretary of State Todd Rakito appointed me to that commission as the swing vote, the libertarian uh, on that commission who helped uh, swing it one way or the other. So it was, you know, I was one of 30 people or whatever, and I, I was helping, uh, you know, that's one of the benefits of having a libertarian elect, uh, sit on a commission or get elected, um, because we see it differently. Now, we had, a, we had like two things we could fund from the federal dollars that we were getting, and we had like eight things we wanted to do to make elections more secure. Things like adding printers to the machines. So you get a receipt, I get a receipt. Um, from cybersecurity to all kinds of different things. So there are many different choices in securing elections and making sure that people have confidence in their vote. What are some of your priorities when it comes to restoring some of that confidence and you know, because I see it as two different problems, right? There's a confidence problem and there's a reality problem with security and invasions from Russia into our systems and like real security issues. So I, I don't know what you want, what you want to start with first. Like, how do you solve the confidence problem? Let's let's go there. Sure. So first, let me echo what you've said. Please get out and volunteer. Uh, your polling places need your your support. They're always looking for volunteers. So it's a great way to get involved, get engaged and see the process firsthand, but also doing more than just your civic duty uh, in voting, but uh, an even greater civic commitment in serving others who are voting. So, Chris, that's a great point. Thank you for making that. Wherever you are in the state, they are surely looking for a volunteer just like you. Um, to your point about making elections more secure. And this is, there are a lot of big words that are thrown around, security, integrity, um, transparency, accountability. And what do they mean? What do they mean? And at the end of the day, it's about how we feel. How do we feel about the results? Are we confident enough? Um, is there, are we, do we live beyond a shadow of a doubt in trusting the outcome? Because if we don't trust the outcome, if we don't trust the process, we doubt the outcome. And if we doubt the outcome, then we can't have trust and confidence in our elected officials. Were they really elected? Are they really representing me? Is any of this fair? And what happens then? So um, at the end of the day, we're working toward a feeling of confidence. And it's a little strange to say, but yes, that's what it comes down to. So how do we create that confidence, that feeling of confidence? And there are a couple different things that we need to do. Uh, when we go into a restaurant, so first let me take a, a step back and say, Chris, it's not, this is not necessarily for you. If you have confidence and, and whoever is listening and, and watching, this is not necessarily for you. If you have confidence and full faith in our elections, wonderful. Surely though, you have neighbors and friends in Indiana who may not have that same level of trust and confidence. This is for them. Uh, 
So imagine we go into a restaurant and we don't know the, the chef, we don't know the kitchen, but we want to have confidence that they're preparing the food safely and cleanly. Uh, maybe it's a new restaurant, so they don't have a track record that we could look to. So many restaurants today have an open kitchen model, right? You can, as you walk in the door, you can look in, you can see how they're preparing the food. It's not that they're trying to get away with anything. It's not that they will, but the fact that it's open and visible and that you can see everything and understand the processes and know that by virtue of that ability to see, not because you're standing there watching them cook the whole time. No, you're sitting, you're, you're seated at your table. Um, but by virtue of the fact that you could, they could be inspected anytime directly by you, <clears throat> that gives accountability and transparency and trust in the process. And that's what we're looking for. So for my two uh, platforms, for my campaign, two different things, and they're, they're, they're combined. One complements the other. The first is a receipt. I want you to get a receipt for your vote. I'm the only candidate who wants you to walk out of the voting booth with a printed receipt in your hands with a tracking number. And you could track your vote just like an Amazon package. You could track it from when it's received to when it's counted and to when it's audited. So you could track your vote through the entire process that way. Currently in Indiana, only 40%, 40% of votes get any kind of paper backup whatsoever. The other 60%, the, the majority, the more than majority, have no paper backup whatsoever. So it's just the computer telling you what the computer thinks it is. And obviously that is even more susceptible because there's no check against that. Um, the Republicans have committed to making that, uh, to giving 100% paper ballot backups by 2024. So that is changing, perhaps. Uh, and many, of course, many counties, many voters already see paper receipts for their votes, which is great. Uh, however, none are allowed to leave the voting booth with them. And that's one thing I'm going to change. So once you have your vote and you can, and once you have your receipt, you can track it. Um, and again, this is to be clear, you're not tracking the, the votes you cast. You can't see whom you voted for because that's obviously very, very secret and the, the secrecy of your ballot is paramount. So I'm not jeopardizing that in any way, shape or form, but you should be able to track your vote and know that your vote has been counted and know that your vote has been included. Now, what about the 100,000 dead people who wake up and and vote the next that, that election day or the fear that 100,000 people did? So for that, we need exclusive testing. We need to make sure that nobody or we've excluded anybody who should not be voting. And that requires an audit. And so currently, Chris, you want to guess at how many counties get audited in, after an election? Well, there are, the, there are 92. Uh, right. There's 92 counties. Counties do their own audits of themselves on their vote totals. Right. But are you talking about if the secretary of state does the audit, if the election right. commission does the so, audit? So theoretically, there there's always risk if you audit yourself, which is why if you go to any movie theater, uh, there's there are typically two separate people, one who sells you the ticket and one who takes your ticket. And that's a concept, a counting concept of dual controls. And that way that there's uh, integrity or forces integrity because it's harder to get collusion. It's harder to have. Um, a fraudulent system if more people are required to do that. So it makes sense to have the Secretary of State, a state level office, audit a county level um, election, and that gives greater integrity and forces everybody to be more honest. So, Chris, would you like to guess how many counties the Secretary, the state Secretary of State audit office audits after an election? Two. It's a that's a very close guess. The answer is five, um, and this is also on the Secretary of State's website. So we're talking less than five percent of counties get audited, and remember, less than half of the ballots actually have any kind of paper backup. So the fraction, the very small fraction of votes that actually have any kind of meaningful audit, is is just fractional. Uh, and it's almost negligible. So on top of that, we don't uh, know which counties or how the counties are chosen. Maybe it's the best five counties, and those are the ones they audit. And then we don't know which races they audit. So maybe it's the, the most perfect, most uh, secure races, and they audit those. Um, and then the part that really galls me is that the results of the audit are not public. They're totally secret. Um, there is one sentence on the Secretary of State's website that talks about the results of the audit, and that just says that it's these are to the highest degree of statistical assurance, and that's defined as 90% or better. And to me, that means um, that the Secretary of State can say we've lost one out of 10 votes, and we think it's been a great audit. To me, that's not acceptable. Imagine if your car didn't start one out of 10 times, or your computer wouldn't boot one out of 10 times, or your phone crashed one out of 10 times, or one out of 10 airplanes crashed into the ground. That's completely unacceptable. 
we need to do better. We need to have a much higher degree of confidence in the audit. And so what I'm calling for is an audit, a complete audit of all 92 counties. I'm calling for an independent audit of all 92 counties. Currently, it's the VSTOP organization, which is out of Ball State, but answers to the Secretary of State. So uh, you can imagine the, the natural conflict of interest that exists when an organization is effectively auditing its boss. Um, so I'm calling for a complete and independent audit of all 92 counties, and I'm calling for that to be completed before the election is certified within 30 days. So currently, we actually um, certify the, or the Secretary of State certifies the election, and then we go on to audit, and that could take months. So how is it, what happens if the audit turns up something that's concerning? The election has already been certified. So what do we do then? And that's the conundrum, that's the, the quandary that we find ourselves in now, and I'm saying that we should reverse that order audit the elections first, and then certify. So here's a couple of problems that I have with your proposal. Um, first, I think it kind of leaves people with the perception that, that they're somehow massively fraudulent with elections. And like these auditing processes, like you mentioned the uh, the ticket taker. Um, mm -hmm. If you go and volunteer, if you're part of a recount, or if you're part of these audits, there's always Republicans and Democrats and libertarians can be a part of this. You can your county clerk can issue libertarians. That's part of what I did as, as executive director, call the clerk or have the secretary of state's office call the clerk and say, give them watcher cards um, so they could be a part of these audits. And so these self audits. And for those listening, a poll watcher is somebody who comes. It was has special authority and access to watch the counting of the ballots. Um, you're a better, watch better the radio guy than me doing doing refreshers and everything. Um so I, I don't want people to walk away with that impression that somehow because of, oftentimes these local, you know, local politics is so much more nasty than anything else. And so now you could make the argument that there are not enough Democrats in Clinton County to watch. Um, you know, that's not the case in Marion County, though, where there's a healthy number of Republicans who and Republican lawyers who go and, and watch some of this stuff. But. It seems to me that auditing between the end of an election and the certification of an election, all 92 counties, might that not be overkill? Won't that take an incredible amount of time? And if you have a secretary of state like your opponent, who is a denier of, of Trump's loss, who is clearly politically motivated, can't can't that invite a. Uh, you know, a wolf into the hen house where, you know, but because to me, one of the, the beauties of our system is that every county in this state, every county in this nation has their own set of rules and systems. And any sort of centralization is not good because it's it's nearly impossible to actually steal a national election just because you have five thousand, three thousand counties or whatever, as opposed to 50 states, as opposed to one government. So are, are you unintentionally inviting a wolf in the hen house there? So there are a lot of questions in that one. So some facts. Yes, there are about 3000 counties nationwide. Um, the secretary of state's office, to, or at least in Indiana, and many states are structured similarly. In Indiana, the secretary of state's office is in charge of overseeing elections. And ultimately, it is the secretary of state, him or herself, who signs off and certifies that election. So that's the ultimate authority and responsibility there. The office sets standards and um, officiates the elections. But at the end of the day, counties have their own rules and their own laws and administer the elections in, in much their own way. And it's been said that there are effectively 92 different elections in Indiana. And there's a lot of truth in that. Um, there's a lot of, there are many differences uh, in law and practice from county to county. And so when you compare your voting experience, the different machines, the different uh, processes, voting locations versus polling places um, or voting centers, there are so many different nuances uh, and experiences across the board. So there really is a wide range, uh, but they are to be within or they, they are to be compliant within the standards set by the Secretary of State. Um, so it's there are pros and cons to having what is what is truly a very decentralized voting process. Yes, if we had one nationalized standard process and centralized, it would become much more vulnerable to any kind of internal or external hacking or corruption, whether it's Russians or a 13 year old in Terre Haute. It doesn't matter uh, because they could be more vulnerable that way. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm generally opposed to HR1 or the bill that comes up uh, perennially in DC that would effectively federalize elections. And I do believe that is uh, protected under the 10th Amendment. It is not defined as a federal right. Um, and therefore, it is up to the states. It is up to we, the people, and it is our election to offer. 
so now let me go back to your question about a uh, a fox in the hen house because this is this is really ties it all together. So yes, uh, for election deniers uh, there are, or even skeptics, this is going to be, or people who just question it, plain and simple, there is going to be doubt among the results. And this is part of these mechanisms that I'm advocating for, the receipts and audits, are meant to give, restore faith and trust in our elections. So I hope that the results of the audit, I hope the results of the receipt show that everything's great, everything has been working great, and now we have the confidence to go forward in life um, together. And that is part of what that open kitchen does, right? We can see, we know we can get up at any moment and look into that kitchen and know that our food is being prepared in a way that we accept. And that is how we move forward. So it's not about enabling um, election denialism. It's about saying, look, everybody has to see the process and trust in the process. And this is what we're going to do because it's the right thing. We can all see the process and we can all trust in the results. Let's move forward together. So you're one of your opponents. Have the Democrats appointed somebody? Is there a Democratic uh, opponent in this race? Correct. There is. Uh, both the GOP and the Democrats held their conventions now about three, four weeks ago. Uh, actually, it would have been uh, June 19th, so a month ago today. All right. So you have a better chance than the, than the Democrat in the state. So uh, we won't talk about him. Um, you know, Jim Rainwater got 13 percent in his race for governor and two thirds. Was it how many counties was he second? Was it 33, right. 32? So Don, Don, the official results were Don Rainwater got 11.5% statewide and uh, came in second place in 32 or 33 of the counties. Uh, and so those two numbers mean a lot. Um, and this all goes back, if, if I can lead into your question, what sure. happens if I get those same results? Yeah, no, I mean, 2% is the threshold for ballot access, but it changes the LPIN in pretty significant ways uh, if you get 10%. And state politics, if you get 10% in this race, which has always been the goal, but I think we're closer now more than ever because of the, uh, your, your opponent was let go by the secretary of state's office twice, I believe, and isn't fit to work there and has the press against him. Um, well, I, I think let me talk about this. That's going to drive a lot of people to you. So I wonder, you know, what's the inner inner party dialogue about hitting 10% and what does that do? if that happens for the LPIN. Sure, so let me make a blanket statement about my opponents. Um, I just wanna say I'm here to attack the problem, not the people. We have so much work that needs to happen in our elections and in our government and to get our government to work for us. Um, I'm focused on solving the problem. And that's why I'm focused on receipts and audits and so much more after that. Um, we can talk about um, recall and ballot initiative and referenda. Those are things that I stand for, the, the opportunity that comes with ranked choice voting as well. Um, so there's so much substance that we need to talk about without getting into the personalities and characteristics. So I'm very happy to stay focused on the issues that are actually going to make Hoosiers lives better. Uh, and that's that's what I'm focused on. So to talk about what uh, 2%, 10% and second place finishes mean, uh, this is all codified in Indiana state law. So this is true for all parties, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Greens party, the Save the Whale party, it doesn't matter. So if you're out there and you are very passionate about a single issue, uh, Save the Whales, let's say, I'm just, I'm making this up, maybe there is a Save the Whales party, I don't pretend to know them all. Um, but if you want to get access to office and to, um, and to votes and to being present and being an influential part of our state government system, you're going to need ballot access. And that starts with, if you don't have 2%, so Secretary of State's race is the ballot access race in Indiana. Um, in many other states, it is the governor's race. In some other states, it's the presidential race. Um, but by Indiana law, it is the Secretary of State's race. And I think my own suspicion, my own personal suspicion, is that that was chosen because it helps diminish the threat of any party who's not Democrat or Republican. Remember, the Democrats and Republicans wrote these laws and then signed them into law. So guess who they serve? So any third party is challenged by this because uh, it's very difficult to get enough signatures, at least 2%, in order to get onto the ballot. Uh, this could be thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of signatures for a statewide office at 2% just to get onto the ballot. And then you have to run a campaign. So the Libertarian Party um, is, is the largest third party in Indiana. And we have had statewide ballot access in the general election 
since 1994, so nearly 30 years. Uh, so every four years, every Secretary of State's race, the Libertarian candidate has gotten at least 2%, and Libertarians have held that 2% statewide ballot access in the general for nearly 30 years. Now, um, under state law, at 10%, any party that gets 10% or more gets not only general election statewide access, but also primary election statewide access. And what that means for libertarians is for the first time, our candidates will get primary ballot access statewide. And in Indiana, because it's an open primary, anybody can walk, any registered voter can walk in and say, I'm a party X, I'd like to pull the ballot for party X. And I would like, I intend to vote for primarily party X members come the general election, and I'd like to vote for them now. So a Democrat might pull a Democrat primary ticket, Libertarian might pull, or a Republican might pull a Republican primary ticket. And that data, so there are two benefits to this. Number one are millions of dollars of earned media benefit uh, by being part of the primaries and being on radio, being on and TV, and being part of the conversation. So there's millions of dollars of value of being advertised as part of the primary elections. Currently, only Republicans and Democrats enjoy that, and only and only those two Republicans, uh, only those two parties for decades. So, if Libertarians get ten percent access, we'll be included in the primaries for the first time. We'll get that access. The second benefit is getting to see who votes in or who polls those that party's primary ballots. So, Republicans get a list of everybody who polled a Republican primary ballot and Democrats get a list of everybody who polled a Democrat primary ballot. And that information is invaluable for knowing who their base voter is uh, for fundraising, for marketing, for messaging, for getting out the vote in the general election. Uh, there's so much value in data. And uh, for the nearly 350,000 Hoosiers who voted for Donald Rainwater in 2020, that is invaluable information if and when he chooses to run again uh, in the future. Just as a base, 120, around 126,000 people vote Libertarian consistently for statewide office don rainwater had obviously three times that and you know when i was there 10 years ago our lists were like three thousand people four thousand people right so you you're relying on people to get in touch with you or maybe you ran into them at a state fair or a county fair versus the data advantage that republicans and democrats have given to themselves uh and so the data that you can get as the Libertarian Party of Indiana will show you if they're hard R's, soft R's, softies, and you can take your chance with trying to market to those people, but you don't know. Um, so it would be a huge, huge benefit along with a big responsibility. Um, can we you know, talk about second place finishes now? Uh, yeah, go ahead. So the, that's the first part is that 10% um, as a goal. Now, Don Rainwater got second place in, let's call it 32 out of 92 counties. So roughly one out of three. And if the sec if that same result happens in the Secretary of State's race, then in each of those counties by state law, in each of those counties, the uh, the county election board comprises of three people, three members. The first is the county clerk. And in Indiana, that's primarily those are primarily Republicans, uh, separately, independently elected. Um, the first place party appoints one person to the board. And the second place party appoints one person to the board. So in most counties, it's a Republican clerk, a Republican appointee, and a Democrat appointee. So two Republicans, one Democrat, zero Libertarians. If a Libertarian comes in second place and beats out the Democrat and the Democrat comes in third place, then in that county, there will be the county clerk, so presumably a Republican, a Republican appointee, and a Libertarian appointee. In that case, there will be two Republicans, one Libertarian, and zero Democrats. And so for those of us who are pro-liberty, whether it's uh, Republican or Independent or Liberty or anywhere right of center, and we want to see real changes to our elections and, and real changes in terms of security and improved uh, efficacy and service and limited government and all the things that right of center stands for, then we'll see real change by having that dynamic radically change within the election county election board composition yeah i'd even argue you know in in blue counties and red counties it's kind of you're getting someone that you can negotiate with like if you're in a red county yeah you probably meet uh, on a lot of economic stuff but if you're a democrat you're going to end up with somebody that is more palatable to a democrat than maybe another republican right if you're in a blue city like indianapolis 
you're going to end up with somebody that is more progressive on on a lot of different issues because they're libertarian than than maybe a Republican might be, especially new Republicans, the new right. Um, I vacillate. And I talked a little bit about this in my last episode. I kind of vacillate between the uh, politics is hopeless and pointless. And as much as I love all my friends in the Libertarian Party and I will always vote and be a member of the Libertarian Party, my desire and stomach for any kind of political action just isn't there, especially the older I get and the, you know, having a child around is hard. Um, you know, what? What? what is the... Who, who cares? Why should I vote for you? Who cares about the Libertarian Party? You guys don't win races. You're not that effective. Like you're not Republicans or Democrats. And and, and politics is all kind of hopeless anyways. Talk me out of it, Jeff Moore. <laughs> so um, we'll get back to that. That's a, that's a heady question. Let's come back to that in a second. Um, but I'll, I'll just to sort of piggyback onto what you've been saying. I've heard from so many uh, voters who call themselves Republicans. They've been lifelong Republicans, uh, but they are absolutely fed up with and disgusted with what they call the rhino Republican in name only supermajority, uh, the establishment GOP that we do have here in Indiana. And so for those who are pro-liberty or frustrated with the status quo or frustrated that we have more spending uh, than um, is within the confines of a limited government um, Republican position, then for all those frustrations, the key is, have the Democrats, this is the second largest party, have they held the Republicans in check? And have they held them accountable? And I think most of us could reasonably answer no. So if you want to see real change, if you want to see any institution or a second party to actually hold the first place party to uh, hold their feet to the fire and hold them accountable um, and hold them to their word, then seeing libertarians emerge as a strong force in conjunction with Democrats um, in that sense, then that's much better. Uh, we can all go back to the euphemism or, or the analogy of the, the two-legged stool just doesn't stand, but a three-legged stool has a lot more stability and has a lot more central uh, focus or, or a greater centeredness on it. And that allows us to have real compromise or forces real compromise and allows us to move forward in a way that isn't deadlock and isn't... Um, uh, the deadlock representative of the duopoly that we all see and, and loathe, especially if you turn on the TV anytime. And it, it's more representative than the supermajority that just decides for uh, for itself. And then we're left accepting whatever they've given us. So that's why it's so important to have a strong second and third party to hold the first party in check. In a perfect system, we'd have um, at least three, if not more parties that are a balance to each other and force a central type of resolution making that actually moves agendas forward and serves Hoosiers. So that's what I'm looking for. All right. Now onto my question. Are you libertarians worth a damn or are you like everybody else and why should I care? And is politics even worth it? So is your future worth it? Um, I, I have to believe yes. If you wake up and you go outside or you look around and say, this is not what I expect. I know it can be better. I believe in a more perfect union. I believe that we can do better. I believe that we are better than this. I believe that we are imperfect. I believe that um, with work and opportunity, we can make things better. Then yes, voting is central to that. Um, it's really part of the American uh, spirit to recognize what is imperfect around us and to have the liberty, both both the liberty and the responsibility to take action and work toward it. Uh, it's not our responsibility to fix or solve all problems, but it is our responsibility to take some action in that direction. It is our responsibility to make a more perfect union. Great, we've got a perfect union now, but it's our responsibility to make it even more perfect. And so that is my argument for voting, um, because if you don't vote, then you have no right to complain. Uh, plain and simple. And that's a hard truth, but I want you to get out there and vote. I want you to have candidates that you want to vote for, not just uh, the least bad option that you want to vote it, vote against. Uh, that's a really sucky situation. And I want you to have good options that excite you. That um, my one of my opponents talks about we're, us being a, or Indiana being a state with a turnout problem. And I think we are a state with a trust problem and that we'll have greater turnout at the polls, if people believe that their vote makes a difference, if people believe that they have candidates that are exciting, compelling, um, and likely to either win or make enough of a difference to actually change things, that gets us excited. If uh, Chris, if I offered you 
uh, choice between vanilla or chocolate poison, which would you choose? Would you come out and, and actively choose between vanilla or chocolate poison? Well, I, I'd just die. That's uh, right. it's not the most of us would just say it's poison either way. Give it to me. I don't care. I, I don't have a choice. Right. And so I think that's our turnout problem. So the more that we can do to make our elections truly competitive and not just in a duopoly sense competitive, but truly a competition of ideas, a competition of visions for our future. And to know that our candidates and our, our futures have choices, then that will get people out. That will get people engaged. That will make things that will make our government more responsive to us. Yeah, I do agree with that. And that's always been the wasted vote argument, right? Like, oh, you're just wasting your vote. Like, I I am not a Republican. Like, I am very much more aligned with the Republicans than, than the Democrats. I'm just liberal enough to attract liberals, but just conservative enough to turn them off and vice versa. Um, as a, a political thinker, I... I have to tell you, though, I don't want to be in the Republican Party and I don't want to support their slate. And I haven't for 20 years. And the Libertarian Party gives me a voice on the ballot. And you see it time and time again with exit polling here in Indiana with Rebecca Sink in 2010 and across the nation. A Libertarian candidate on the ballot increases the amount of people that are willing to vote as opposed to shifting. They, it literally like pulls evenly from Democrats and Republicans and increases the people who weren't going to vote otherwise in exit polling. Um, Cato and David Bose have done um, some studies on this. You can find it on Kindle, all the books and all that. Um, so, yeah, I, I appreciate your answer. I think you've inspired me. I'm, I'm happy to do anything I can to help you. I want to have you back to talk about small businesses and how libertarians can help small business owners. Uh, and we'll save that for another conversation, maybe here in the next month or so because I'd love to have you back and uh, you gave great answers. So Jeff Moore, this is shameless self-promotion time. Tell people where they can follow you. How can they get involved with your campaign and how can they give you money? Sure. So uh, I'm so glad you asked, Chris. Uh, the website is moreforindiana.com. That's M-A-U-R-E-R -E for Indiana.com. And from there, you can find our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, our YouTube, uh, coming soon to TikTok. So all those things are out there. Uh, there is a big yellow donate button right there. And remember that at the end of the day, campaigns, all political campaigns have two inputs. Those are dollars and volunteers and one output, and that's votes. So if you want the votes, I'm going to need or ask that you generate or you donate your time or your treasure because that's what's needed to actually make a difference. Um, so whatever your ability, uh, please step forward. And I'm very grateful for that. So that way we can have a brighter, freer future here in Indiana. Don't ask whatever. Now, this is the former campaign director coming out at me, Jeff. If anything, you could do anything that be. No, ask. I. Channel your inner Evan McMahon and ask people for $5,000 right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you have $5,000, uh, we will gladly take it. There is there's no limit. Uh, remember, by Indiana law, there is no limit on personal contributions to state and local offices. So unlike federal offices uh, and FEC regulations, you can give and keep giving and give until it hurts. Yeah, and the reason that I'm I'm pressuring him to give money is because they've got to print postcards and they've got to pay for gas to it's fair season. How many corn on the cobs and elephant ears have you eaten in the last three weeks? So corn on the cobs and elephant ears, not so many. I'm really into the lemon shakeups and okay. those I'm trying to, I'm trying to estimate the, the number of gallons. Uh, and also by the way, when you convert the number of refills of a lemon shakeup to uh, gallons, it's about $40 a gallon for lemonade. <laughs> still a little bit more than gas, but not by much. And that's still, that's still up in the air about which will be more expensive. You clearly have a very analytical mind. Like you, you're like thinking about inputs and outputs and ga gallons of lemon shakeups. So we we probably did very different scores in math, um, but yeah, no, it is important to give candidates that will represent you well some money. And if you're out there listening in the libertarian diaspora that doesn't think the national party represents you, Indiana is still standing up for classical orthodox libertarianism. So. Jeff is a great person for you to support. So if you pulled your money from national, give it to Jeff. I really do appreciate everybody listening. So Jeff, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Chris, thank you for having me and I'll continue to work on my beard uh, until next time. All right. I, I expect at least three quarters of an inch next time, but just get past the itchy phase. All right. <laughs> all right. Get past the itchy phase. Got it. Thanks for listening, everybody. We really do appreciate you here at the Chris Spangle Show on the We Are Libertarians podcast network, and we will see you again soon. Good night, all. Thank you.